Hey there, sports psych enthusiasts. I'm Dr. Colin Fair, and I want to share my passion with you. I love talking about ways to unleash the power of the mind. This recording is part of a larger lecture series I've created in an effort to make sports psychology concepts more accessible to a larger audience. The information contained in this series is especially well suited for students of sports psychology and is presented in a way that makes for easy listening for all. Welcome to Sports Psych Concepts. Hello, all you listeners out there. Thank you for tuning in for this next lecture on the Sports Psych Concepts lecture series. I'm Dr. Colin Fair. Got a good one for you planned today. This is probably one of the most searched uh, sort of self-help topics out there on the web is, is stress and how do I deal with it? What are some tools? What are some ways that I can overcome some of the stress. And we all feel stress, right? But some of us, it seems to be more of a burden than others. So we're gonna go over a definition of stress just to kick things off to make sure we're all on the same page and have an understanding of that. Um, and, and I'll try and paint a picture, sort of an illustration for you to grasp that. Uh, and, and then we'll touch on some of the common causes of stress. If we were to categorize them, all of the things that we experience, could we somehow group them together? Uh, I've got a, a way to do that. We'll talk about the stress response itself in this, in simplistic terms, not like in neuroscience and all the things that go on there. There's other uh, recordings out there that, that can go over that stuff for you, but definitely wanna to touch on the relationship between stress and performance because there is something there and stress, we have different terms for it. It's related to anxiety. It's related to arousal or activation, the sort of energy that we feel that comes with that. So we'll touch on some of those things. So well, along with that, some theories of the stress performance relationship, like how, how do we explain what that is? Because there's some different ideas out there, uh, some better than others, some that are dated, some that might make sense in certain situations, maybe not in other ones. And, and then of course, we've got to discuss some strategies for how to manage stress, because that's really the juicy stuff. And it's what people want to learn more about. And, and of course, we've got to do some groundwork, lay some groundwork it, it, before we get to that point, because that can help us have an understanding for how to better manage it if we know those things. So with that introduction, let's jump into the content. So the first thing we've got to do is define stress. And so you'll hear different expressions of this out there. So I'm stressed, right? What, what, what does that mean when that someone says I'm stressed? And how does that compare to being stressed out, right? What is being stressed? What is being stressed out? Is there a difference between those two? And, and, and really, so our experience of stress universally is really predicated on our on this this sort of ongoing evaluation that we have of whether we have the capabilities to meet whatever the demands that are placed upon us so there's we always have varying demands coming from all these different directions and so we feel stressed when maybe there's an imbalance between what we feel are our capabilities to meet the demands or how we interpret those demands as, as they're coming at us, which I'll get more into those details. So that's really how we maybe would de define stress. So when we generally consider ourselves where, okay, well, there's these demands placed upon us, but maybe I have the capabilities to meet that. All right, well, I'm stressed because I still have to meet the demands, but I have the capabilities, so I'll feel stressed. But when we get to the point to where we, our perception is that we're unable to meet those demands, our capabilities don't rise up to what they are, that may be due to more an insufficiency in our capabilities rather than resources then we may be considerably more stressed and in, or, or at least we may just interpret it more negatively, okay, so a, as a threat. So if we have these chronic feelings of insufficiency, our capabilities are insufficient to meet the demands, then that's when we may say that we are stressed out, okay? So that's the different differentiation, important to differentiate between just merely being stressed, feeling stressed, 
and being stressed out, which is that chronic perception of feelings of insufficiency. So to illustrate this for you, if you, if you had uh, capabilities and demands placed on a balance or with a fulcrum in the middle, right? So if the demands weigh more than the capabilities, we perceive the situation as being threatening, right? Then we're going to, we're going to view that situation as, well, we're going to interpret what we feel or experience as high stress, right? I'm high stress. If my capabilities don't weigh as much as what the demands are, there's way more demand placed on me than what I feel like I'm capable of. And I'm going to feel that. And, I, and especially if I perceive the situation as threatening to me of my person or self, self esteem or my character or who I am, then, then there, it will be very high stress. If we simply interpret it as a challenge, even though we may feel like maybe our capabilities don't meet the demands, then the, the stress will still be there, but it may be a lower stress response. Now, alternatively, if our capabilities weigh more than the demands, then we're simply just going to be bored, right? It's like with this, the, the, we're not going to have much of a stress response. And usually, you know, we have a stress response that's going to affect our behavior in a big way. We're going to either try and solve the problem or we're going to try and help ourselves feel better. It's a couple of different ways that we cope with those experiences, right? You deal with the problem. It's a problem focused coping strategy, or we deal with the, uh, how we're feeling or the emotions. That's an emotion focused coping strategy okay so the the demand itself and how we perceive the demand is is really important but if our capabilities exceed what the demands are then then we're not really going to feel stressed we may just feel kind of bored or apathetic now if there's a match right so if we're if we're viewing the the the, the stress or the demands we say that it's just as, as a challenge right so there's not going to be as much of a stress response and we feel like our capabilities can meet the demands then there's going to be lower stress or or we might call it use stress which is good stress right we need to have some le level of stress in our lives to perform and to meet those demands to meet expectations so a lot of Athletes do this through just a lot of people in general do this procrastination is an example. There's just not enough stress if, if a due date or a deadline is too far out there for us. There's not enough stress right now to to motivate me to behave to complete the task. But then when I get closer down to crunch time, all right, I feel enough stress now that it's enough stress that I feel that that I'm going to act and actually do something. So. So some of us kind of naturally use this use stress idea without really understanding what it is. Like we need to have some level of stress to drive us to act. So what are some causes of stress? Of course, this would be a limitless list if we were going to go and write all these down and create bullet points and brainstorm all of that. It would be completely individualized. But this is what I alluded to at the beginning. How might we categorize the, the causes of stress? If there was some way that we could lump them all together, all together, and that's what I have for you, some general categories of the, the causes of stress. So the first would be intrapersonal stressors. Okay, so these are things that are just within us that and, and how we live our lives that are causes of stress. So personality may be a factor here. Some of us rate higher on trait anxiety, which is just a little bit more of an innate thing that we have as part of our personality where we, some of us tend to be more chronic worriers. So all of us are stressed, but some of us seem to be more stressed than others and stress uh, more about things that others don't really stress out about. Okay, so we can have, it can be more of a trait thing for some of us. It can be related to self-esteem, something called social physique anxiety. I've talked to different athletes about that, where they show up on the starting line of a race and they're feeling really intimidated and stressed out just because of the physiques that some of their competitors have around them. And they're concerned about that, even though they have an equally chiseled physique and an equal performance level to compete with them somehow this 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 comes out right like i said can be related to self-esteem this social physique anxiety some interesting th th interesting things that can cause 
stress, but lifestyle demands, how we deal with our finances can be intrapersonal causes of stress for us. So there also can be situations, of course, this is really kind of what we normally think about is like, oh, I'm not going in that situation. I feel stressed, certain social situations, I'm not going to do that. Uh, but in r relation to the sporting context, the importance of the event tends to cause greater stress. So for example, I'm going into a preseason game versus a postseason or championship game. Stress levels tend to be higher in postseason, in those bigger games, bigger competitions, because we build it up in our mind, the importance. We say, oh, well, it's just kind of preseason, whatever, we're just practicing. It's an intra-squad, it's a scrimmage, so the importance that we attach to it is lower, so we don't have as much of a stress response. Important to understand that. Then, there, then there's the uncertain, uncertainty that happens within a performance situation. It's like we we can prepare for it, but we don't totally know exactly how it's going to unfold. And uncertain, like most of us don't like uncertainty. We want to try and control things, so we make things more cert certain. Now, some of us do. We embrace that and say, all right, I don't know what's going to happen here, but let's go. And, and so in terms of athletics and sports and performance, it's an important skill to learn how to embrace the uncertainty. But in, in the context of this discussion right now, we need to recognize that uncertainty, the importance of the events, those are some situational factors that, that can cause stress for most people. Another cause of stress is relationships. So this is this is actually a big one, big big source of stress. We think about our own lives as we listen to this. It's like, yeah, okay, I've had I've had different teammates that have bothered me, done things that stress me out, or family relationships can be big ones. Coaching relationships for athletes oftentimes are a big source of stress. Like, oh man, he just doesn't get it. I don't know, it just doesn't understand me and. The things that he says sometimes, and so so a lot of it can be relational, big sources and causes of stress. And then the, the last one, and, and there may be other ways to categorize these, but the last one that I'll mention is that the tasks itself, right? If there's certain things require us to go through adversity or to do hard things, if that is the path, like we're kind of naturally wired to choose the easy, easy path. We wanna find out how to make things more efficient. And so we're always trying to find solutions to, to, to these outcomes or paths to these outcomes that are easier. We want the shortcuts, but the reality is there's some things in life where the task, it's just, it's just hard. If you want to achieve the goal, you wanna to get to the outcome that, that you say that you do, Sometimes it's adversity, Their adversity is the only way to get there and we have to be willing to go through that, but that can cause some stress. So interpersonal things, situations, relationships and tasks, all different ways that we can categorize the things that cause us stress. So the stress response we should touch on as well is what is it that is going on in our body and at least in a general sense like i said i'm not going to get too far out in the weeds on this but there's ways that we can classify this as well so the first is well we have this cognitive response okay what's going on with the thoughts inside our mind when we feel stressed is it is it this worry like oh no i don't know if i can do this negative expectations or these performance apprehensions what are the thoughts that are bouncing around through our heads? And, and it's interesting because some performers, you can talk to them before they go on and perform and they'll kind of tell you, you know, what, what it is that they're thinking. The thoughts just kind of blurt out, come out. And it really is a great reflection of what's going on internally in, in their minds. And that, that's part of the stress response. It's a reflection of what it is they're going through with their thoughts and what it is that they often verbalize and tell you. So the stress response can be cognitive, it can be somatic or physiological. So this is what we experience when we have the butterflies or we experience some muscle tension, we feel our heart rate go up, our breathing rate goes up, we start to sweat. Some athletes are notorious pukers, right? They, they, they get so worked up before a big competition. Bill Russell, famous NBA basketball player was was well known for that. Some, before big games, he just work himself into a frenzy that he'd puke every time. 
in 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 this is uh, uh, basically for some others it becomes a ritualistic experience as part of their stress response. But th that can also go on the other end of the spectrum. So myself, when I would gear up for big competitions, I would actually yawn a lot. And I remember one of my college coaches saying, oh yeah, that's a good sign. That's a good sign. It means I'm like, what do you mean it's a good sign? Like, shouldn't I be awake and alert? It's like, yeah, the yawning, you have these different things that happens, a physiological response to stress, what it is about. You're about to put your body and mind through when you go out into battle. So they can be, stress response can be cognitive, somatic or physiological, and of course it can be psychological or behavioral. So you see different things that people do. They may, they may start pacing back and forth or they're fidgeting, right? They, they, they talk more, they joke more, or they, they talk less, maybe they're more quiet, right? It's, it's, it's very interesting to see the behaviors that people fall into as part of their stress response like whoa what's going on here like you you're you're feeling stress or or it could be some some destructive behavior people go and drugs and alcohol right to the max to the extreme as a way to deal with their stress so that's a psychological response and then we have emotional responses of course to 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 round it out here which is these are just the emotions the feelings that we have it could be fear right it could be doubt uh, generally negative emotions like that is, is in, in, in not, and not always, it could be emotional response like excitement, right? Oh, I feel I've got this nervous excitement. As it, it, and, and a lot of that has to do with how we interpret the thoughts or the situation and, and whether we have the capabilities to, to measure up to that. So those are the different ways we can classify our stress response. It can happen in your mind with your thoughts, your thinkings. It can happen in your body, somatically or physiologically. Of course, behavior is a reflection of that psychologically, and then our emotions, what we're experiencing. All different ways we can categorize our responses to stress. So then with that, how does stress relate to performance okay so there's this sort of general theory out there that's really one of the best ones to help explain this this relationship and so when i'm talking about stress now i'm really referring to sometimes called arousal physiological arousal or activation right what your energy level is there's that the, the, like i'm saying you have that sort of nervous excitement the butterfly feeling just that that activation that you have as you're going into competition or preparing for a big practice or, or whatever it is, right? So you have that. That's what I'm talking about here when I say arousal. So you have this, this classic theory, it's called the inverted U theory and the Yerkes-Dodson law. And basically it's the, the idea that the, the optimal arousal um, follows a sort of pattern. There's this middle, there's this middle ground of optimal arousal. So uh, it's in, in terms of it enhancing performance. So if our arousal is too low, it's not going to enhance our performance. If our arousal is too high, it's not going to enhance our performance. There's some sweet spot in the middle. Okay. And the York Stodson law is basically the idea that that can vary depending on the task, the skill level of the person, right? So if, if, if I'm, doing a one rep max on the deadlift, then the arousal level, optimal arousal level will be different than if I am putting a golf ball from four feet away, right? So that's the idea. And if, if I'm a highly skilled athlete, maybe I can tolerate higher levels of arousal than if I'm a lower skilled athlete. So these are all different things to keep in mind. This inverted U idea is very useful to understand because uh, it, it, it takes these things into account, but it's, itself is maybe a little bit limited just in the generic sense of saying, well, there's some middle ground that's optimal for everybody because it, 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 it varies depending on the individual, okay? But uh, another way I like to describe this is like we just, the amount of ampedness, right? So we can either be under amped or over amped when we're going into a competition and so, we need to recognize what our optimal level of ampedness is, okay? And then, and then we, we add in our own performance characteristics um, to determine, you know, what, where our level needs to be to, to perform at our best. So with that, we can transition to this idea of the individual zone of optimal functioning 
here, which basically it just it it's it's a um, another way to look at this idea that there's some optimal level and maybe it'll be higher or lower on the on the arousal anxiety level, right? That activation level or the amped up or amped upness, right? How much of that we need to have. And, and it's linked with our emotional patterns, okay? So it can be functional or performance enhancing or, or it can be dysfunctional or performance impairing these different emotions that we have, okay? So if I'm, I'm motivated, I'm supercharged or I'm, I'm uh, confident, well, those are positive emotions that are gonna enhance our performance or if I'm nervous or I'm angry, right? Maybe those can actually still enhance performance but we classify those as negative emotions. And, and if I'm feeling tired, depressed, or sad, right, or I'm just kind of relaxed or content or peaceful, those are going to be performance impairing emotions, whether they're considered positive, if it's content and peaceful, or negative, okay? So basically, there's this idea that the emotional intensity that the performer experiences, if it's outside their optimal bandwidth, then their performance won't be as good. Okay, so one athlete might have a lower bandwidth, another athlete might have a middle bandwidth, and the, another athlete may have a higher bandwidth of, of arousal or activation, amped upness that they need to perform, and, and they need to know what that is. So some other theories to kind of explain this whole stress performance relationship that are that are prominent that have been out there a classic one that really is mostly outdated now is called the drive theory it's not really supported but it really kind of was foundational for some of these other theories and and basically the idea is that arousal and performance have this positive linear relationship so as arousal activation continues to go up higher and higher than performance also goes up so th this, there, there may be some situations where this makes sense. So I gave you the example again of a, of a, uh, say an Olympic deadlift, deadlifter, right? And it's like, yeah, get amped up as much as possible as you, you can for that one rep max. Like you, you need that. So maybe the drive theory applies in that situation, but it certainly isn't going to apply in fine motor skill events or, or, or activities. So limitations to the drive theory, but a, a good one to, to understand from a historical perspective. Then we have this multidimensional anxiety theory, which considers both the cognitive and somatic aspects of anxiety. So not just like what's going on and how we're thinking and the worry in our minds, but also what's happening uh, physiologically in, in our body, okay? And so there's, the, the crux of this is that somatic anxiety, what we're feeling physically, that follows the inverted U idea, okay? Where, all right, what I'm experiencing, that activation level in my body, physical activation, there's gonna be an optimal bandwidth. I can't be under activated and I don't wanna be over activated. Uh, there's some, some sweet spot in the middle. But cognitive anxiety has a, a negative linear relationship with performance, right? So as cognitive anxiety goes up, and performance goes down. So we don't really wanna have all this mental anxiety. It's okay if you have this somatic physiological sort of activation that's there, you need that, but we don't wanna be have all of these worrying thoughts that are troubling in our minds to perform. Okay, so that's the multidimensional anxiety theory. Another interesting one is called the catastrophe model. So th this is the idea that it, performance follows an inverted U if again, cognitive anxiety is low, but when it's high, then a catastrophe, catastrophe can occur, okay? So basically it's like, all right, we'll see this, this uh, performance goes up as anxiety goes up, but if, if cognitive anxiety is too high and we get into this performance situation, then it can lead to something called like choking, right? It's like, oh man, everything was going okay. And then you just overshot, you totally overshot your optimal level of arousal uh, from a cognitive standpoint, and then and then just performance plummeted. So it wasn't like this nice even inverted U where it slopes up and then gradually slopes back down on the other side. Basically, it goes up and your performance falls off a cliff. A catastrophe occurs, and it takes actually in order to regain uh, the the trajectory that we're we're on, we have to actually reduce 
our arousal level down to below what would be optimal and then bring it back up. So an interesting idea, some different, different approaches and techniques for that. Another one is called the directionality theory. This is one that I'm a big fan of. So our, it, basically the idea is that our, our interpretation of anxiety symptoms is what matters. So kind of puts that at the port, forefront. So if we view anxiety or interpret it as positive or a helpful thing, as it's being facilitative, right? Then that's that's a good thing for us, right? We can experience that, but we interpret it as a good thing. It's like, all right, that's energy, use it. Or if we interpret it as negative and, and a detrimental thing is debilitative, then it's gonna be that because that's how we're interpreting it. So we need to look at both the intensity of the anxiety and the, of the interpretation of the anxiety. Okay, so if we view anxiety as facilitative, then it's gonna help our performance, of course, which is, which is what we are going for. So why, just to get to the sort of mechanistic components here of, well, why, so we got these theories to explain the relationship, but why does arousal or activation influence performance? So a few different ideas here as well. One is called the processing efficiency theory. So when, when a person is anxious, a proportion of their attentional capacity for whatever the task is that they're doing, it's it's feel, filled with task irrelevant cognitive worry, right? So we have this this idea that we have only so, have so much mental space, and so we should be, and it's it's limited. So if we if for optimal performance, we need to be dedicating a large majority of that to the the task that we're doing, but we're worrying about all these other things. What I'm going to have for dinner after? What am I going to say in my victory speech? Those things are are going to reduce basically our working memory capacity and it's going to impair our cognitive processing efficiency right and 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 potentially performance so that's a processing efficiency theory then we have the attentional control theory which is built around the idea that anxiety it influences efficiency but but it doesn't influence effectiveness quite the same okay so which is runs counter to some of the uh, other ideas uh, that I've mentioned so far that, that in that high levels of cognitive anxiety, they're not inherently negative, right? So it can serve to motivate athletes if they use that, but, but it's at the expense of us using greater attentional resources. Okay. That's the idea. So it's like, all right, well, so processing efficiency theory, theory we only have so much capacity this attentional control theory. It's like, oh, it's not necessarily a bad thing to have these different thoughts going on. It's just, we're kind of sacrificing some of our attentional resources when we do that. Then we have something called the conscious processing hypothesis, which this, this can help, can help explain uh, phenomenon like choking or phenomena like choking and the yips, right? Some interesting things that happen out there. So a, uh, uh, a high anxious performer may start to overthink skills that they've already learned. So they should be in the automatic stage of learning and performing, right? They don't really have to think about it, it just goes out there and happens. They refine movements, they focus on the feeling, and then they, they, they start to overthink and they go back to the cognitive stage and it's all of a sudden it's like they're a beginner there. Things become disjointed and, and um, everything's disrupted, might look a little bit more robotic, really not super fun to experience those things. Okay, and we also can have just generally the physiological effects. So tension or fatigue or coordination can be influenced when we get super activated or, or aroused. Like sometimes a a athletes will experience this where they get even a little bit shaky. They're so activated, they're so amped up, like, whoa, what's going on here, right? That can obviously affect your coordination and your skill. But there can also be psychological effects. So Attention is a big one. So if we have an increased arousal, we tend to have a narrower attention, right? So we miss important cues. We're so amped up that we, we get a tunnel vision focused in. Or if we don't have enough arousal, then it's like, well, we're paying attention to do many things, right? We have it's really broad attention. And so we're paying attention to unimportant cues, for example, like the crowd, what's going on right there. And, and so our arousal can affect what we concentrate on. 
And, and the, if we were to really classify these, we might say, well, there's three thoughts that lead to cognitive interference, right? So performance worries, where we're thinking about how we're performing and maybe the outcome, and we're concerned about that, or it can be situation irrelevant worries, okay? It's so like, oh man, how does how do my my uh, socks look, or you know, what is what do I do I look like a doofus in this uniform or whatever, you know, irrelevant to the to the situation. And then thoughts of escape. So this is a classic one. A lot of athletes go through this before a competition. Like, do I really want to go through this? Like, oh, what can I do? Can I fake an injury? All these like, actually, we have those thoughts as perform as we're going into performance because of the the situation especially when we interpret it as a high threat or evaluate it with high threat then then our our attentional control goes down it specifically okay different studies have been done on the the quiet eye right and our eye gaze in and, and it gets disrupted when we have a high um when we don't fixate on the right things, right? Or we don't fixate long enough, okay? So the, the simple example here would be keeping your head down on the golf swing, right? Keep your head down right there. We get too anxious, we're concerned about where the ball is gonna go, or if you've ever played golf before and you have some people who are playing faster than you and they catch up behind you and you know they're just pulling up in the golf cart as you're taking, you're about to take your swing and so you kind of rush your shot and you don't keep your head down and all this stuff that can happen. Right, so that's an example of how how attention and concentration can really be affected, and and helps explain why arousal can influence performance in that particular regard. So now to the really good stuff, right? It's like this is what everybody really wants to know: is how to, we got that background information, we understand how what stress is and how it influences per performance and 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 the relationship there but how do we deal with it right what what what's our what's our formula so i like to think of it in in, in three primary ways the first is that you've got to manage it right it's stress management it's not stress elimination it's not always even stress reduction it's stress management we must manage it okay it's it can't just be allowed to kind of run rampant so the, the question always is, all right, well, okay, that's pretty obvious, but how do we do it, right? How do we do it? So <clears throat> the, the first real tip here is that it's got to be specific. And it's got to be, what I mean by that, it's got to be specific to you or to the athlete as an individual. So I knew a, a world-class 800-meter uh, middle-distance track athlete, and this athlete was amazing, had all the different accolades, and she was on the about to be on the starting line of the world championships, some some big race uh, at the highest level of the sport, and was super anxious, really nervous about it, and was trying to figure out a way to manage the stress that she was experiencing to bring it down a little bit. And so she tried to think of something that would make her smile. So she's standing on the starting line of this big race, and she thinks of her husband in a recent experience where he he bent over and blew out the back of his pants, right? Just tore his pants. Pants were a little too tight, and 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 it made her smile. Like that's what she thought about on the starting line of this big race uh, on on an elite stage. And so that's an example of something very very specific to the individual that was helpful in managing the stress. Okay, but it also needs to be specific to the type of anxiety. So you can classify anxiety or stress, you could, it's cognitive or it's somatic on either end of it, right? So if I'm having some negative thoughts that are cognitive, that are rolling through my mind, some self-talk could be in order. That would work for that would that would work for cognitive anxiety, right? But it also could be what you say to others as well, as how what are the first few words out of your mouth? I think of this when I was coaching athletes and I talk to them, ask them a general question and the first few things they say is really, really indicative of what's going on in their mind. So we can have, uh, we need to be specific to the type of stress or anxiety we're experiencing. So we address the thought part of it, but then if it's phys physiological or somatic, breathing is like the classic one, right? That's the go-to. Breathe all the way in, 
hold it and then let it out slow, right? This idea, this it's like this long drawn out sigh, right? You take a breath in, almost two breaths in, and then it's this slow drawn out exhale. It can be really, really powerful for getting some of that stress to melt away, okay? And then, and then we also need to, to target what it is we need, okay, in terms of specificity. So we need reduction techniques. We're trying to actually reduce this, the stress burden somewhat to tone it down a little bit, turn it down a few notches. That's our way to managing it. Or we're restructuring it, right? How are we interpreting it? And we have to interpret it as facilitative. It's very, very important. Okay, and, and is this energizing thing, basically. We need to reframe it to something that we can use. So I'd like to describe this as it's like solar energy, right? This, the situations in our personality, that's the sun that contributes to the anxiety stored in our solar cells. And we can store that energy or direct it toward what we want. Right? So we have all of these different things that are contributing to the anxiety that's there. It's in the solar cells and we've got it sourced. So how do we use it? We direct that energy. We plug in these different things to it so we can use that. And, and <clears throat> things like self-talk or goal setting or imagery are some, some of the specific examples that a lot of athletes like to use. But most importantly, we have to interpret it as a facilitative thing. This is some energy that I want to figure out how to capture and then direct and use that so I can I can benefit from it. So a few other strategies that may be helpful out there uh, to, to consider and there's so many that really you could search the web and find a million different ways. That's why I mentioned it's like, it's gotta be specific to you. You can look at all these other things that other people use and maybe you'll try it, but you wanna find something that's specific to you. But one, one good thing to try is, is planning and prep, right? I don't have to feel stressed because I put in the planning, I put in the preparation. So we can do that, we can seek advice from others, we can try and learn. As part of our prep, we can gather info, right? And anticipate different things that'll happen so I don't have to get stressed out because I've already kind of played it out in my mind with visualization or, or imagery, problem solving, or, or uh, you know, the seven habits of highly effective people. Habit number one is be proactive to take initiative, right? So, so exercising those things it, before we even find ourselves in that situation can be an extremely powerful tool. It's, it's your planning and preparation or a, and, and maybe some sort of prevention to a certain extent, but not totally, right? Because it's not, it's not stress prevention, it's stress management. We're gonna experience it, interpret it, interpret it as gonna be a positive thing and plan and prepare for it. So then we should focus on what we can control. So this is, this is especially important if there are a lot of things that happen to be out of our out of our control and this is a, a lot of us carry baggage we get stressed out about things that we really don't have any control about and we complain to others who don't have any control they can't change our situation but we like to go and complain to them so it's like nothing's going to change so is that really is that like helping us or what is it that's going on right we're not talking to the people who can do anything about it and so it's better to save our breath on that and focus on things that we can do. It's why breathing and routines are really useful and why athletes like them so much. It's like, well, okay, I can't control the outcome or the uncertainty of this situation, but I can control my routine. That gives me something to do that I can focus on so I don't have to spend all this time thinking about these other things that, that are stressing me out. So really a, a, an important thing. Then there's this it, embrace the suck idea okay and and with this it, it, essentially what this is is something that goes out out around out there in sports psychology circles is is to find joy in the suffering essentially so it's it's going to suck there's certain aspects about it that are just going to be hard and going to be uncomfortable and we're not really going to like that those feelings of vulnerability that much and learning how to lean into that and accept that and embrace that is a normal thing and interpret that as a normal thing and even as a good thing is, is one of the most fundamental tools 
out there. So this is, hey, this is a normal part of life right here. This is a normal part of my competition. I, why do I need to get stressed out about it every time? Like this is what we do this for is to feel this. This is why people go ride roller coasters. It's like, oh man, I feel so vulnerable exposed. And then like you live through it and it's cool. It's like, this is what we're here. We came for this feeling. This is why we're competing. It's why we're in competition because we, you don't get this any other way. So learning to embrace that is an essential tool. And also connecting with your why can be a good one, right? It keeps us grounded. That's our anchor point. Why am I doing this? Why am I out here? I really do actually want to do this. At least I say that I do. So here I am. All right. This is, this is why I'm here. That can be helpful. And then there's a lot of other different strategies out there. So progressive muscle relaxation, autogenic training, where we're kind of training our body to feel this warmth and heaviness. We're doing body scans. We target the specific areas we're experiencing. If it's mostly uh, somatic anxiety or stress, you use meditation or hypnosis, something called stress <clears throat> inoculation training. It's like you're inoculating yourself to the stress. You're using imagery, self-talk and relaxation and some a personalized program there's stress management training okay where a sports psych consultant can help athletes use imagery and use things like rehearsal okay so there's a lot of different tools out there like i said so many different things but some of these foundational principles are essential for being able to deal with that stress so with that that are, those are all the main things that I wanted to touch on today. So in review, we defined stress. We talked about some causes, those different uh, common factors, the task, right? The situation, there's interpersonal things, uh, relational things. Uh, how does our body respond to stress? Whether it's cognitive, is it emotional? Is it is it uh, physiological, right? And, and what's the relationship between stress and performance? all of those different theories out there that try and explain that. And none of them are totally perfect in how they capture it. And so we consider all of them to have an overarching understanding, which helps dive into the mechanisms, like why does arousal, why does that even influence performance in the first place, right? And then lastly, we touched on those strategies that can be, that can be helpful for dealing with it. So as you've gone through this, I hope that it was helpful for you. Hopefully you can go use some of the tips that were mentioned here, or at least go and dig a little bit deeper and see what else you can find. So thanks for listening. And I'll catch you next time. Thank you for listening to this recording in the Sports Psych Lecture Series. I hope you learned something. More importantly, I hope you learned something that you can apply in your life. Feel free to share this presentation with others who might be interested. And if you're interested in more content like this, visit the Fair Advantage channel on YouTube or find the Fair Advantage podcast on Spotify or visit my website at fairadvantage.com.